Welcome to Globefish Interviews, where we speak with leading experts on international trade and fisheries. My name is Joe Zelazny. Today, we're joined by Auden Lem, Deputy Director of FAO's Fisheries Division. Auden, it's great to have you with us. Nice to be here with you. Well, Auden, let's get started. Last year, FAO celebrated the 25th anniversary of the Code of Conduct for Responsible Fisheries. Fish production and trade is an important economic and social activity in many regions around the world. How does the Code of Conduct foster sustainable trade and strong participation of developing countries and small-scale fishers in national, regional, and global markets? Well, the Code of Conduct, although it was established more than 25 years ago, it was really a forward-looking document. It sets at a very high level the principles of sustainable trade, sustainable production, and also the sustainability of, of social, uh, social sustainability. So it really includes all the three dimensions of sustainability. And, and then what, what about trade? Uh, as I said, it sets the principles. So the, the details of how to implement uh, sustainable trade is then developed uh, both globally and, and regionally, nationally through um, other instruments, implementation instruments, such as either national legislation, uh, inter international agreements, the framework, for example, of the WTO. And, and of course, the, the Code of Conduct says specifically that anything that deals with trade should be um, within the framework of the international rules set down by the WTO. And, and what then about specifically uh, sustainable practices, sustainable trade? Well, as I said, the code of conduct sets at a very high level the principles of sustainability, including that of sustainable trade. And we have developed uh, a number of, of, of guidelines that flow, that come out of the, the code of conduct that, that subsequently have been adopted by the international community, have been endorsed by FAO uh, members, and therefore fostering international trade in, in a sustainable manner. F for example, uh, the uh, the guidelines on catch documentation schemes, which which allows for proper traceability and the legality of of products when they international freight come out of the of, of the code of conduct. The same with the the guidelines, the specific guidelines for sustainable trade. Again, um, the chapter eleven of the code of conduct deals with trade and deals with how to make it more sustainable. And we have developed guidelines that have then been endorsed by our, our members and are being implemented also uh, nationally by policymakers, but even more important by the industry, by the stakeholders themselves. So I think the, the Code of Conduct, although it's inspirational as, an, as a voluntary code, it really has encouraged and made a, a, a number of instruments and tools come forward that really ensure that trade and, and markets and consumption is, is now much more uh, sustainable than it was uh, in, in the past. Of course, there is still potential for improved things, but the principles of further improvement are there and can be found in the Code of Conduct. Access to market information, such as prices on fisheries and aquaculture products, is an important step towards ensuring producers have equitable access to markets. How is FAO contributing to this end? Well, FAO in, in general and, and Globefish specifically is um, making available a number of, of data, a number of information that is really useful for, for the operators. First of all, FAO is the only um, agency or organization in the world that provides global statistics for, for production, for, for catches, for aquaculture production, and also specifically for, for trade in fish and fishery products. So in that sense, FAO provides a lot of very useful information for policymakers, but also for, for, for operators. Then specifically, Globefish, of course, um, provides uh, up-to-date market information, price information for a number of very important products in, in, in international trade. It provides analysis on, on trade trends, on, on markets, on consumption trades in all major uh, markets of the world. So in, in this sense, also Globefish, uh, fulfills a very important role as a provider of, of information. But market access is, is more than information on, 
on products and more than information on prices. Globefish is also doing an excellent uh, role in in providing information on import requirements, what to do in order to be able to export to the most important import markets in, in the world. Of course, uh, the EU, US, Japan, but also many other important markets. And in fact, the markets in the world that really are, are growing the quickest now are in emerging economies, you know, in Asia, but also in a number of other very important emerging economies of the world. So. Glowfish, together with its uh, sister network of, uh, of regional organizations and, and um, organizations such as InfoFish, InfoSamac, Eurofish, uh, InfoPesh and InfoPesca are together providing a lot of information, not only on the products, on prices, on market trends, but also what to do in order to be able to fulfill the input requirements in these markets, especially related to uh, quality and safety issues, but also to legality of catches, of traceability, uh, etc. So also for this first purpose, um, Globefish is doing a very important role together with our colleagues in FAO uh, as such. Globefish is a long established source of information on trade in fisheries and aquaculture products. Are there any new products being developed that we can expect to see rolled out over the coming months? Well, since Globefish started out more than 35 years ago, a lot of things have changed. Uh, of, of course, and, and Globefish is, is changing and, and evolving, and not only because of new technology, IT technology, but also because the needs of, of its, its uh, constituents are, are changing. Globefish continues to provide analysis on, on market developments, on input requirements, but also is, is launching a number of new information products, more interactive, more innovative uh, with uh, and, and increasing also the dialogue with stakeholders to be able to to ensure that what is provided it really reflects the also the the, the needs of of industry and the stakeholders. So Globefish is is really um, changing and evolving with the needs of its its constituents. Some have argued that exporting fisheries and aquaculture products can diminish food security for local communities. Is international trade compatible with raising social, nutritional, and economic standards in local fishing communities? Well, I, I think that when we look back over the last 25 years, um, after the implementation or the endorsement and the implementation of Code of Conduct, I think it's incredible the changes we've seen in, in, in production, in consumption, and in trade. And I think one of the most uh, the, the biggest achievement of the fish and fishery sector in this period has been its ability to produce more and to raise consumption patterns, consumption uh, of, of fish and fishery pr products all over the world to an average today of, of 20, 21 kilos. And of course, this is done through uh, increased production through the stability of, of capture fisheries, um, but in particular, the, the increase in aquaculture production. And of course, this, this uh, reflects and responds to, to changes in, in demand and, and changes in, in, in the consumer habits. Now, is there a conflict between exports and, and local consumption? I would say no as long as, as the fisheries are sustainably managed, as long as fisheries are sustainably managed, th there is no problem as such in, in exporting products because exports are not only allowing consumers in, in areas with no access to waters or no lakes or no, no oceans, but uh, an, an active population that needs a, a supply of fishy and fishy products. But, but certainly it also raises the economic well-being of, of, of people in the, of the population in the exporting countries through, through job uh, provision, through processing activities and trade and export uh, activities. It also allows uh, the generation of very important uh, revenues from, from exports. And in fact, if you look at some of the countries with the lowest um, produ um, the lowest levels of, of uh, consumption of fish and fishery products in the world, you still see that they do export 
and, and they may have a net export in terms of value, but they do import more in terms of va uh, volumes than in, in, in fact they, they export. So even when you have important activities in, in export, this also allows you to import. And very often what is exported is high value species that is not always the most nutritious. Um, lobster and other high, 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 high product or high price, uh, high, high valued products, but allows you to import a number of much larger numbers of, of uh, very nutritional uh, fish and fishy products, such as small pelagic. And this is the pattern, for example, that you see in regions such as, as Africa, which uh, prefers exporting high value uh, products and import with the export revenues generated, uh, very nutritious uh, products uh, such as uh, small pelagic mackerel in particular. But, but again, uh, the, the key to this is, uh, is sustainable management of the resources you have in order to enable you to continue the export uh, in, in, in the future. That's a good point and something to keep in mind. Trade works in both directions. It's not only exports, but also imports. Next, I'd like to ask something about a new trend that we've seen. Increasingly, consumers are demanding more information about the products they consume, including about the social and environmental impacts of their production. How is this trend affecting the international trade of fisheries and aquaculture products? And how can FAO support the sector in adapting to these new trends? Well, the trade, the trend we see in which consumers and all actors, I, I wouldn't only limit it to consumers, but cons consumers certainly, but also retailers and traders and the public at large is seeking more information about what they eat, what they consume, what they drink. And of course, this also affects us in, in the fishery sector. FAO, of course, supports the, uh, th this need and drive towards more transparency um, on, on, on trade on production methods, uh, on the legality and the origin of, of the product and how the fish was produced or, and, or caught or, or farmed and where it was caught and farmed and what are the tools, the, the, uh, the, the production methods, the, the, the nets or the, the, the trawling or the persane or whatever is the activity or the type of, of farming. We all support and encourage uh, this provision of additional information that consumers in the past did not seek as they do today. And, and consumers really, of course, also want to, to ensure that what they consume has been sustainable, sustainably uh, produced. And not only from an environmental point of view, they want to know that it has been farmed sustainably and, and, and caught sustainably, but they also want to know that uh, it has been done from respecting the social aspects and, and the well-being and, and the livelihoods and the decent working conditions of those, of the millions and millions of people, or men and women that are engaged in fish and fishery products. So FAO are, are encouraging this. We have provided a, a number of, of, of guidelines, whether it's on certification as such, but also now more and more on, on, on decent work and on the social responsibility of, of the operators. And this is something we are not doing alone. We are doing it together with FAO members, with stakeholders, with other agencies such as ILO, UNCTAD and others. And, and this is something that we are uh, being encouraged to, to intensify this work. And we are doing this, um, in fact, right now through regional consultations. And we will bring this to the subcommittee on fish trade and then to COFI for its uh, further recommendations on this. And, and just to, to say something finally on this, it's been very encouraging to, to deal with these issues. And I must say that in particular, the response from industry, whether uh, the produce, whether we talk about, in, uh, about producers or, uh, or distributors or retailers, I think this, this support has been very encouraging and will ensure that the, the final result is also robust and can be useful and practical, practical for the operators. That's great to hear. FAO isn't just on the sidelines watching these trends, but is using its convening power to bring people together to foster conversation, to reach consensus, and help the industry respond. 
Now, changing gears, I'd like to talk about the COVID-19 pandemic. Everybody is living it, and it's had a profound effect on the fisheries and aquaculture sector, like all sectors. Despite the many negative impacts caused by changes in demand and consumption patterns, as well as disruptions to supply chains caused by mitigation measures that were put in place, particularly at the beginning of the pandemic, some positive market opportunities have also emerged. We've witnessed innovation and seen a reorientation toward local and domestic markets, as well as the creation of new products. What lessons can be learned from these opportunities? And do you think that these changes are here to stay? Of course, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has been a, a terrible event, which is still ongoing with, with incredible consequences for all economic sectors, including the fish and aquaculture sector. Um, of course, the, the first thing we did was to, to work together with the stakeholders in developing policies for how to ensure the safety, first of all, the safety of the millions and millions of men and women that are engaged in fisheries or aquaculture or in distribution, and then further to ensure that food production was continuing, that supplies of, of food and of, of fish and fishing products would, would continue to, to to go unhindered as much as possible in order to reach consumers that need fish and fishy products. However, as you allude to, there also have been some positive outcomes or some outcomes that also have been positive. You mentioned innovation, there's digitalization, and I would also say that the number of processes that we use have become safer because they've been standardized, they've, been, they've become more digitalized, and allowing for a smoother pattern of work. And of course, this will also um, make the operations in the future more, more, more smooth and, and easy. Um, also in terms of development of products, we've seen changes, we've seen development in, in new packaging, of course, safer and more sustainable packaging, maybe a change in, in, in sizes because of the tremendous impact on, on, on the catering sector in particular, which has then forced the operator to channel more products to direct consumption. We've seen innovation in terms of, of distribution and, and the way products are sold through uh, electronic platforms, etc. So I think this is something that will remain. So it's not that the COVID has brought along so much change, it's that the, the speed of change has increased. We, we saw these trends already, but certainly the pandemic has increased tremendously the, the, the speed of change. And I think this we will only see. And I think it, it has also opened up uh, the minds, not only of consumers, but the operators of the many opportunities that exist out there. Now we all work uh, virtually, electronically. So I think it, it has also overcome the physical distance that in, in the past was a barrier uh, to many of the ways and, and the contact that we, we entertain. Now, I think the, the, the world has, or the sector has become even more globalized than it was. It, it was already one of the most globalized sectors in food production with one third of everything that is produced, farmed or, or caught entering international trade. So among food sectors, I think it, it's not wrong to say that our sector is the most globalized, but this pattern of globalization has not stopped. And I think it will continue at, at a quicker pace than we've seen in the past. So perhaps a little silver lining to this pandemic and maybe moving forward, greater opportunities for producers and also more options for consumers. The last question I want to ask you today is related to FAO's work on fisheries and aquaculture, which is guided, of course, by the Committee on Fisheries, which is where member states consider relevant international policy issues, as well as the subcommittee that deals specifically with issues related to fish and trade. How are the decisions of these committees affecting the global seafood market? Well, as you mentioned, the, the FAO's Committee on Fisheries is the only international forum which really uh, makes recommendation um, on issues related to fisheries and aquaculture issues, um, whether they relate to aquaculture production or fisheries management or, or trade, etc. And I think... These meetings that take place every two years with up to 700, 800 uh, participants 
are doing a very important, playing a very important role. But in order to facilitate the work, some of the technical work has to be be prepared by what we call the, the two subcommittees. So one subcommittee on agriculture and one uh, subcommittee on, on fish trade. In particular, the one on fish trade has then developed through expert consultation, technical consultations, consultations at, at, at large with its members, with stakeholders, etc., in preparing the technical work that then feed into COFI and then goes to COFI for further, further endorsement. Some of the, the outcomes of, of, of the work of the subcommittee on fish trade, for example, are the, um, the guidelines from FAO on, um, on certification, on certification related to uh, marine, uh, marine fisheries and to inland fisheries, for example. Um, to, I mentioned already the guidelines on uh, catch documentation schemes, which ensures the legality of, of catches of a product as they enter international trade. Um, also, the ongoing work on social responsibility is dealt with by the, uh, the subcommittee on, on fish trade. So again, being more specific, they're able to prepare the work at the technical level before it's moved to the higher level, to the policy level by, by the policy makers meeting at COFI. So I think they're doing a tremendous work, which is crucial to uh, to the works of to the working of, of Kofi by preparing it uh, in, in in detail before it goes to Kofi. Well, it's clear that the decisions of these committees, in the form of the guidance they're issuing, have an impact on the sector and influence the way seafood is traded. But where can industry go if they want more information about the issues and topics being considered by these two bodies? Well, the the com- the countries that to come to, to Kofi, of course, they come with, uh, or the subcommittees come with national delegations. And very often industry is represented in these national de- delegations through its national associations, not as individual companies. Uh, of course, FAO is a very transparent organization and um, through its Glowfish pro- uh, project, but also other programs, we, we make sure that uh, the information we have is, is made available uh, through our website, through our communication products in, in general. I, I would also say that industry, individual companies are encouraged to, to engage with the national or international associations and thereby interact with FAO and other agencies at, at the higher level. So certainly um, industry participation in national or international associations allow them also to interact with bodies such as the FAO. In terms of the agenda of, of COFI and the subcommittees, of course, these are set uh, in, in a dialogue between FAO as a secretariat and its member countries. There is a dedicated bureau of, of all these uh, bodies which with, with national representation of, of the FAO members. Now, in terms of being uh, relevant for, for the sector and, and for industry, of course, uh, we deal mostly with policy issues, setting the agenda and therefore uh, working on guidelines and other instruments that win, will one day also impact directly the, the operations of individual companies. And, and we try to be as transparent as possible in this by uh, not only putting the agenda and the reports and all the various documents for the various meetings um, on, online, of course, well in advance of the meetings and also... I would encourage uh, the industry and individual companies to become even more active through their national associations, through international associations uh, that have relationships with FAO and with other international agencies, whether they are uh, UNCTAD or, or IMO or, or, or WTO for that sake. So we certainly encourage this engagement, but um, through the FAO members and the industry associations that are approved and registered uh, NGOs and observers at uh, our international uh, meetings such as Kofi and the two subcommittees. Alden, it was great having you with us today. Thanks for sharing your insights and we hope to see you again soon. Well, thank you, Joe, and I was pleased to be here. Thank you for joining this installment of Globefish Interviews, where we speak with leading experts on international trade and fisheries. 
We look forward to having you with us next time when we'll continue the conversation. In the meantime, subscribe to the Globefish newsletter and get the latest information from our website at globefish.org. Goodbye for now.